Bonjour à tous. Merci beaucoup pour votre présence, malgré la, la chaleur. Nous avons la chance d'avoir euh, des, des invités internationaux, en tout cas avec une expérience euh, en, en tant internationale. Ce que je vous propose, c'est qu'on cette masterclass se tiendra, euh, euh, se tiendra en, euh, en anglais. Alors, Financia is very delighted uh, to receive international masterclass uh, today. Uh, we are very fortunate to have uh, four esteemed speakers with us today, sharing the knowledge and uh, expertise. Uh, we have a uh, Uh, sorry, but just first name Kitty. Yes. Uh, who's vice president at Thailand Stock Exchange. Uh, Chui Bono, a PhD, full professor uh, at the um, uh, University of Paris II, uh, Assas. Uh, Mr. Uh, Philippe uh, Devos, who is uh, one of the co founder and the speaker on, the, on blockchain. And uh, Adam uh, Hassib, uh, specifically work with fin Financière du ZES. Uh, specialist uh, from uh, blockchain uh, and uh, in, in law. And uh, uh, we have Mr. Dufresnet who moderate uh, this, uh, this master's class. Um, I would like to give a special thanks uh, our partnerships with uh, Blockchain Work, uh, Asan Law Film in Gibraltar, who will be broadcasting this event uh, on YouTube, uh, INSAT Competitive Intelligence Alumni. Uh, Too. Uh, and this event uh, will be uh, in live on uh, on Facebook. Um, Comment on va le trouver sur Facebook pour, pour partager, pour taper quelque chose uh, Financia Business School. Sur, sur Financia. Yes, Merci. you can find on the page Financia, uh, Financia Business School uh, in live uh, now. Um, I see some uh, partners and, uh, and friends uh, in this master class, and I would like just to say and, uh, and, uh, hello, Talium, uh, uh, Napoleon X, uh, Smart Chain, uh, too. Uh, they are good friends, close, but are close, close together, and uh, I'm sure uh, this year we will make uh, wonderful things. But just to uh, before to to begin, like we'll make a. Around the, in the world about the blockchain, uh, I propose to to begin by the, the friends, uh, and I, I would like uh, to give uh, a all uh, my friends uh, two two Bosera who are making uh, an STO uh, in savings agriculture, uh, something very uh, particular, and uh, I invite you to, 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 to come here. And begin. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, good evening. Turbo Serrat is a cooperative consortium resulting from the transformation of a trading agricultural exchange side bringing together the actors of the agricultural sector, farmers, suppliers, collectors, processors, etc., as well as consumers and financiers. The financial center works with a serial account unit that makes instant payment of trades It makes it possible to manage the data value chain in the blockchain ranging from grain to bread and facilitate confidence and enable farmers to innovate towards transition ecological expected using the latest methodologies in uh, artificial intelligence. Turbo Serial uh, provides crop financing and draws the reduced intervention fee at different stages of the chain. The target market brings together all the actors of In the, in the agricultural sector, every farmers, cooperatives, businesses, banks, insurers. This market represents about 100 billion euros for France and Belgium. The competitive advantage of Turbo Serral is great. Uh, indeed, Turbo Serral frees the farmer locked into a tripartite contract between the bank and trading. Turbo Serral allows it to get cash from the seed and the freedom to choose suppliers and customers, negotiate with them, and recoup margin. Turbo Serial already generates about 3 million euros in sales, as a potential clientele of about 2,000 uh, farmers in several important trades. The weight is strong for farmers who are experiencing cash difficulties among traders who face payment difficulties of farmers in particular. The proof of concept uh, 
is already made and the MVP approved by a large number of factors in the sector. The farmer margin must increase by more than 10%, thus allowing a really important evolution of this result. About the blockchain and the STO, uh, using blockchain technology as a result of the Confident Act, we are also immediately able to consider a new form of farm raising allowed largely thanks to smart contracts, the STO. Startups with a blockchain based project have started to exploit the ICO, then to raise record funds. Our needs are also very important. We have retained the STO. The four reasons for our choice, choice sorry, are the first one, technique, technical. The project is based on blockchain technology, and uh, Julien will uh, uh, talk about it in, in, a, in a few seconds or minutes. And we have an excellent uh, math mastery of this technology for our integrated service, TurboChain. Legal, compliance and reg with regulations, taxations and law, the legal pillar is brought by, to us by the expertise of the US financial company, Finance Finance. Human, a team, a team and service advisors to carry out the project. An in-house team with a great deal of expertise as well as the choice of the best partners, Talion for tokenization, TurboChain for the blockchain, Financière du Zest for the launch of the SEO, the yes lawyers for the world. The fourth point is uh, marketing, good use of social networks and traditional media, an in-house communications marketing department, a press relation agency, and excellent communications between the different players, uh, particularly between the uh, Italian, Financière du Zest, and uh, RIN, our agency. Today, with the help of Uzes Financière du Zest, we began drafting white paper and presenting the project to the regulator, the AMF. We are planning a press conference on September the 5th, followed by a conference and a roundtable discussion. We will talk about the energy and the environmental transition. The chosen place is a Parisian Mecca, the place to be. That works for better. And now, uh, Julian uh, is going to present. Yep. Uh, so now you might be wondering why, uh, why is the blockchain and why is the supply chain and why is there a business in it? And I will try to answer you uh, to sum up in a, several, a few points actually. The first is uh, blockchain is cheap. Uh, cheap to use, the technology is there, so you don't have to worry about uh, some architecture of your project or managing some weird things, since the blockchain uses uh, everything you need to know uh, in order to make a supply chain and some traceability about any products. And, uh, and also it's immu immutable. What it means? It means anything that happens in the blockchain will be written forever. Let's take an example. You have a, a seller who wants to sell his uh, stock of wheat, for example, and associated with it, with Turbo Chain, he creates a token and declares uh, its carbon tax. And uh, as once it's created, it cannot be changed, and in any data created this way won't be able to be falsified. That makes a huge impact on uh, whatever you create, and uh, the final customer will be very happy about that, to know like it's, you can trust this technology. Uh, blockchain also follows the hype around any cryptocurrency, uh, since the cryptocurrency uses the blockchain, it's a methodology, it's a technology. Uh, so, since now the Bitcoin is rising up, so it is a blockchain becoming more interesting. Um, TurboChain is our application and it's on a private blockchain uh, because we use a lot of features. In order to make it in a public blockchain, uh, like we will make a link between the private and the public blockchain by uh, ERC standard token, uh, and uh, but you don't need to have all the information in the public blockchain because otherwise it would be very, very heavy. And 
Jesse's remark uh, the cost model. Uh, um, what else should be good? Yeah. No. Uh, All right. Then. Mm -hmm. then thank you very much. Okay. Thank, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you so much. So. So this was one case of a new STO to take place in the French ecosystem, French and Belgium ecosystem. Mm -hmm. yes. And uh, well, that's a very interesting case uh, because it puts us exactly in the situation we are trying to describe in this master class. So for, first of all, thank you very much for being here. Uh, thank you to all who are watching us right now live on Facebook who are going to watch us on the podcast of Assens Law Firm, which is uh, one of the leading law firms in Gibraltar. Why in Gibraltar? I will explain in a few minutes, because we're talking about the perceptions, the perception of ICOs in the world. Why did we do that tonight on a Friday evening when it's sunny, when people go on a vacation? Well, that's very easy, because we, have, we are very lucky to have with us tonight Next to our very distinguished speakers, we have somebody who is a VP at the Thailand Stock Exchange. So our speakers are all very important. But uh, Mr. Suchetasil here comes from Bangkok to tell us about his work. All right, so I'm going to give you a presentation of each of the speakers. And again, I'm really sorry if we're a bit late, it's my fault. It's because I was stuck in the traffic to come and pick up Mr. Suchetas here. Our first guest is uh, somebody I really respect because uh, he's my director of research. So I really, really respect him. <laughs> is Mr. Thierry, Professor Thierry Bonneau from Paris Assas, who is director of the Doctoral School of Paris Assas, who is full professor, tenured, and who is an expert on the blockchain, on ICO, and in general, on financialization of the private law. So maybe you want to tell us a little bit more about yourself, Professor Bonneau? Uh, what can I say? I'm professor of law. I'm specialized in banking law and financial law. And I publish several books in banking law, financial markets, uh, European international regulation. In fact, I'm a lawyer. I'm not someone who uh, imagine and to implement blockchain and so on, but uh, I have a certain view about the subject. And I think that uh, but maybe I can expand uh, uh, later on, but uh, I think there is a big difference between uh, currencies and bit, uh, and um, ICO in fine, because uh, finally the issues, uh, in my opinion, are not exactly the same, particularly if you consider the uh, general uh, impact on our society. And uh, I think that maybe when it comes to ICO, the issues are more technical, even if, in fact, there are several interesting issues, particularly the nature of coins, of tokens. What does that mean? Is it a security or not? And after, how to organize the protection of investors? And I think this kind of question is particularly vital. Is the reason why you have the law of the 22nd of May uh, 2019, uh, La Loi Pacte, and there are some provisions in this law, and if uh, you studied a little, uh, you know that this regime is optional. In fact, there was a, a, a consultation, in fact, before the law, particularly by l'AMF, l'Autorité des Marchés Financiers. They published several works, they asked some uh, opinion, uh, clearly, uh, they asked me what I what I think, because I'm a member of uh, one committee, a consultative committee, the Commission Epargnant uh, de l'AMF. And in fact, in this committee, there are representatives of uh, investors. And uh, finally, the question is, uh, what kind of product when you consider uh, tokens, but uh, what can be the protection? In fact, I was not a fan of uh, to organize uh, 
of organizing the protection of the investor. The only point I think we should be cautious is the way the market in fact, this kind of financial operation. After I think it's the question of the freedom for people who are uh, at the origin of this kind of financial operation, and after we should explain to investors that maybe something which is not so interesting from a financial point of view, at least there are some risks connected to this kind of operation. And I think people must be uh, responsible about what they want to do, what they want to buy, if they want to be involved in this kind of operation. But I, and I, it will be my last uh, point, I think there is a big dis dis distinction to make when you consider the legal aspect between Bitcoin, uh, cryptocurrency, and this ICO. It's not exactly the same thing, uh, and uh, because uh, uh, it's not only technical, it's only uh, it's also something I think uh, all these operations and the way you built the legal regime applicable to this kind of operations has really an uh, impact on our society. And particularly it's true when you consider cryptocurrency. It's less true as regards uh, ICOs. Thank you. Thank you. Professor, so that's all about the impact on society. That's why we're doing this master class. We all heard about Bitcoin and blockchain, but what happens when it reaches the world of finance? You're in a financial business school. This is Financia, and thank you, by the way, for hosting our event, Financia Business School. Now, what happens when the big two coin, uh, when the blockchain meets the finance world? The regulators are not ready, but the investors are. So, as Professor Bono says, we need to protect the people who are going to put their money into these schemes. We can't just close our eyes on it. I'm not uh, sorry for interrupting you, but I'm not sure that we can say that financial authorities are not ready. I think that uh, there are more and more products, specific products, and at what moment, and the protection as a cost, as a cost for the financial authority. And finally, I'm not sure that it's possible to uh, be sure uh, to organize uh, a total protection for any products. And it's a question of about the way you imagine uh, the society in the future. Maybe in some areas we uh, should say maybe there is no specific protection because there is a cost for our society. You can be interested in this kind of product, but be cautious. And if you need, you lose. If you lose, you lose, just like about the startups 20 years ago. Now, let me introduce our next speaker, Kitty Suchetasil. I met Mr. Suchetasil when I was doing my research. I, I visited several places in the world who are interested, which are working on the on ICOs. I met Mr. Suchetasil uh, at the Thailand Stock Exchange. I was amazed by the understanding he had of the world of the blockchain. And he told me how advanced the Thailand Stock Exchange was, hence G7 tonight. So, Mr. Suchetasil, can you please introduce yourself a little bit? Okay, can you can call me Gitte, because uh, Thai last name is uh, usually long. <laughs> just, just call me Gitte. So I'm in charge of, I'm executive vice president at the Stock Exchange of Thailand. I am uh, leading the uh, digital transformation in the Thai capital markets. Uh, we are doing in two things. The first is to enhance the infrastructure in the current setup, in the traditional way, to be fully digitized. That's one way. That's one thing. And the second thing is that we are looking at uh, setting up a digital asset ecosystem in Thailand for this kind of technology disruption. Uh, a bit of background about myself. I've been at the SET for one five years, 15 years. So I had experience in setting up the derivative exchange in Thailand and also lead the strategic development at the exchange. And I'm now doing the digital transformation at the exchange. So I'm coming from, I would say, practitioner point of view, from the market infrastructure point of view. And maybe later on, but um, just be clear that uh, tokens, Bitcoin, distributed electric technology, especially these tokens, this is actually nothing new. It has been there for a thousand years. But uh, the token in the past, even today, is in a physical form. 
now it's being transformed into digital format. Uh, just uh, take an example. If you don't um, into it, um, digital tokens, tokens, banknote that you have today is a token. It's a physical form, and um, you can transfer the value from one person to the other because of this banknote. And what the trust in this kind of transactions happens because you have a securities feature in the banknote. That's when people, the two of us, trust that this is a real banknote. But in digital tokens world, uh, we exchange the value uh, from token from one person to the other person peer to peer. <laughs> and that security feed is a new card. <laughs> and the secure feature is actually using consensus mechanism. So people in the network say that this is a trusted transaction. So it's actually nothing new. It's just transformed from physical format to um, digital form. And if you think about, uh, a lot of people are confused about a Bitcoin, uh, blockchain, distributed ledger, ledger technology. Uh, just take an example. Uh, you, have, you all have the smartphone in your pocket. If you think about blockchain or distributed ledger technology as uh, your smartphone and iOS or Samsung phone and the, um, the Android, that's actually blockchain or DLT. Bitcoin sits on blockchain. Bitcoin is your, the application. It's just like Facebook or YouTube. So if you think about it like that, uh, the things that we are approaching today is not really new. It's been there many, many, many years, but it's just technology innovation that allow something new to happen. And um, um, uh, uh, it's like, it's like a blockchain is Windows and Bitcoin is Office. Yeah, something like that. So don't get confused about that. And uh, digital assets, digital core tokens, it's a superset. Bitcoin is one thing. Cryptocurrency is one thing. It's, sub it's a subset. Many people misunderstand that Bitcoin is blockchain. It's cryptocurrency. It's, um, it's uh, digital, digital assets. It's just a basic. And uh, just to address Professor point, I think um, digital tokens uh, can be classified into many different categories. It's whether it's payment tokens, uh, utility tokens, or securities tokens. And uh, we believe, I, at least myself, I believe that um, in the future, these classifications would become obsolete because essentially it's going to be hybrid tokens. It's a tokens where rights and benefits are defined by the token issuers. If you think about share today, it's actually a form of tokens where rights and benefits are defined by law, that you have voting right, you have ownership benefit. But in the future, these tokens can actually be defined as the way that product issuer wish. For example, today you have only voting right one, one share, one vote. In the future, with digital tokens, you may have veto right with that token. And you can have rights, for example, a token where you have rights to own a piece in a company together with a utility to buy product and services issued by that company, or even product and services issued by other companies. It's so uh, the, 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 the cash card or the token that you go to Subway, MRT, uh, is also a token. It's just a physical form. So uh, there are many things like there are Bitcoin. Yes, it is a digital asset that you can have tokenized real estate which is actually the same as real estate investment trust today in existing world. It's not really new. So don't get overexcited about it. It's just a form. But uh, I, I would suggest that we, when we look at this uh, regulatory framework, we have to look at the substance of uh, what these tokens presents. If it is a revenue stream in the future, it's a security, it's a securitization. If it is a product, a token that's actually associated with product, product and services, it's just like uh, you buy a ship cart uh, going to access the, uh, your underground, your subway. Uh, what is actually new is that uh, mathematically proven Bitcoin. That's actually a new asset class. And if you think about it, 
Bitcoin is not different from gold. The gold has its intrinsic value because uh, people believe that everyone trusts it and it may have economic value that it's in, it can be used to produce a chip in the smartphone and the price fluctuate because people trust. Bitcoin can also be seen as gold. It depends on demand, supply, and the trust. But what is different from gold is that it doesn't have physical, real, intrinsic, intrinsic value. value. So, um, so, it's, so the regulator should see this as a more of a substance, not a form. So that would be my introduction and some of the views that I have. This is my personal view, not the view of the SCT, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so we have the underlying technology that is blockchain. And then on top of that, it issues tokens like applications that can be either crypto cryptocurrencies or utility token. If they refer to a, a service or product we can use in the future, or it can be uh, STO, which is securities. You can also tokenize gold. Yeah, you can also tokenize gold, which means that you have gold, and this gold will be divided in several uh, titles Units, of property yes. that can be issued via a token, a digital token. Yes, but I think you should have in mind, from a legal point of view, it's particularly uh, vital to determine what is the asset in fact. And uh, I'm not sure that we can say that tokens, for example, are not new. They are new from a legal point of view because it was not new. I, as a lawyer, I uh, would have any problem in order to determine the legal regime applicable. And in fact, you should be aware of the fact that if people uh, invented finally tokens and don't use securities, securities it trigger the application of the prospectus legislation, for example. And because they didn't want to be covered by such a legislation, they try to imagine other financial product. And the state is really to determine what is the asset, in fact. And if you have, if you say, okay, there is a receivable behind the token, behind the code, clearly, I don't care if it's a share or a bond, but it's a security. Consequently, I have to, apl uh, to apply the prospectus legislation. But if I say no, from a legal point of view, I can't consider tokens as securities. Here, there is a problem. And it explains, finally, the new legislation, in fact. After I agree, in fact, token is, um, blockchain is only the technology. And after we have several uh, uh, use, in fact, of this technology, and even from a legal international point of view, but I don't remember, I think there is maybe a, 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 a um, it is a mistake, but in fact, when you consider the international report, they refer to the ledger registered technology, and they underline that blockchain is only one uh, manifestation of this new technology, and we mustn't, in fact, identify blockchain and uh, ledger registered technology. DLT, distributed ledger technology. If so I may, I'll just please, pick up please. from Professor Point. Uh, what we are now looking at in terms of regulatory perspective and also legal perspective. We believe that we should apply existing legal framework wherever possible. That's the first one. The second one, there might be some amendments to be made to existing legal framework to facilitate um, this technology. And lastly, we should, we should look at new legal constructs to support this, uh, this kind of thing. Uh, I'll just take, for example, this is very technology specific. In this kind of network, there will be a new role uh, in this ecosystem. For example, a validating node who validates uh, the, 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 uh, something in the network. But uh, there still be security repository, maybe. There still be exchange. But uh, these are existing uh, players existing actors, but that could be new. Uh, that comes from the technology advancements, which uh, Professor has rightly pointed out. Yeah. 
Thank you. Which leads me to the other side of this round table. So let me introduce first Mr. Uh, Okay. Well, he, uh, he, has, he has a suit, he has a tie, so... Adam <laughs> Asib. Adam Asib, okay. I work uh, with him uh, at Financial Business School and he's also a teacher, he's also, sorry, he's also in charge of uh, fund management at uh, Financier Duzes. And we keep uh, crossing each other at every blockchain-related event yes. uh, in Paris. Mm. So, could you please introduce yourself a little bit? Yes, of course. Thank you, Philippe. Okay. Uh, so... Uh, Hello, everybody. First of all, um, thank you, Financial Business School, my old school, huh? and his, his president who is not here. <laughs> uh, so um, uh, I work in blockchain uh, issue uh, at uh, Financial Duzes uh, on legal and uh, finance uh, part. Financial Duzes is uh, an investment company uh, which, uh, which is also a custodian, uh, securities custodian. So uh, we uh, we help to, uh, to make happen some uh, ICO or STO. Uh, this is um, a part of uh, our job, who is uh, which is increasing and uh, becoming very important now because of uh, value added of uh, blockchain. So we financial users work on two parts. We can divide uh, in uh, in two parts the activity: the fund management. Uh, and uh, the other part, uh, fund management with um, um, assurance, um, uh, uh, assurance, vie, assurance uh, life insurance. Uh, life insurance, sorry, thank you. And uh, fund, uh, hedge fund. Uh, and uh, the other part is the corporate, uh, the capital increase, uh, bond issue, IPO, initial public offering. And uh, recently, ICO since uh, one year, two years. And uh, STO, uh, as with, uh, with uh, Chobo uh, today. Uh, so um, we uh, now we uh, we help the company to make happen uh, their, their 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 ICO their STO and uh, also the some other to uh, to create a, a, a blockchain fund so to we 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 work to tokenize uh, securities on blockchain and we also work to. Uh, uh, the inverse of tokenize uh, Bitcoin on uh, historical uh, finan finance. So, uh, that's like for example, uh, getting a, a token or STO, getting it listed on the Paris Stock Exchange. Uh, uh, we, for, for instance, um, we can uh, create a, a fund who, uh, which, which could um, um, uh, permit to to access to Bitcoin in um, insurance life. That would be very interesting. There is uh, one very famous couple in the world who is trying to do that. They have a fund in cryptocurrency and they're, they're trying to have it listed on the US stock exchange, the NYSE. It's a couple of very, very famous twins. The Vinkovos brothers who happen to be not only in the Bitcoin, they have 1% of the quantity of Bitcoin in the world, but they're also uh, co accidental founders of Facebook because they made 65 million out of trial on Mark Zuckerberg. And incidentally, they are a bronze medal champion in rowing at the Harvard rowing team. So these kind of guys are the kind of guys you cross every day in the streets, right? So they are yeah, trying... Yeah, I mean, in France, we have the Bogdanov brothers. Brother, yeah, pretty much the same. Exactly the same league. <laughs> pretty much the same. Yeah, That's yeah. crazy. So, which leads me to introduce uh, to you, but does he need introduction, Mr. Philippe Devost, whom I know notably from the Centre des Hautes Études du Cyberespace, another great school which is located in a wonderful castle. Versailles. The castle of Versailles. Absolutely. So, please, uh, thank you. Mr. Devost. Uh, so, good evening, everybody. Uh, congratulations, because we know here on this table that we are probably the last uh, obstacle between you and your weekend. So <laughs> we are trying to make it as, uh, as fun My as possible. My apologies for that. No, no, I'm <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, and congratulations to Kitty because I've never seen uh, a stock exchange executive being so clear on what, uh, on what this all is about. Uh, Thank you. I've been, uh, I've been interested in the topic for the past three years, four years. And uh, when we started discussing about that four years ago, uh, there is one... Uh, one of uh, the former teammates in the room, uh, most people were just telling bullshit about this, and this is still the case. And the reason why is that we are probably dealing with one of the most complicated uh, concepts, uh, because if you want to seize it, you need to have a very strong mathematical background, 
you must have quite a strong law background because you need to be able to define the objects that we are dealing with. And then you need to have some creativity because you need to admit that all of this is intricated and that there is some, some magic in it. Uh, most of what has been said is that the, te the technologies or, or the pieces of the puzzle that, that are assembled are not new. And actually, I don't know if you know where and when uh, was uh, double, double entry accounting invented. You have a clue? China? It's been invented. In, no, 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 no. It's been invented in Venice by a Franciscan monk called Luca Pacioli, uh, 1494. Uh, so it's European. Uh, it is just one of the cornerstones of the whole financial and account, accounting system, and it's, it's a ledger. So I will just take this example. One of the constituents, the ledger, has been around for 500 years. So, but the magic is, again, how it is used and how it is intricated with, with the rest. So that's my first observation. Um, second, if I'm going back to my introduction, I'm not a professor. Uh, but I would like to add that I'm not a professor yet because I would love and I would dream to become one uh, one day. Uh, I think this would be my... Uh, no, I, yeah, I'm, I'm serious about that. I hope this is a first step. Uh, yeah, yeah, in a way. Uh, so if I would have to add a few words, um, in some cases I've been asked for in the past to define what this is about, in, uh, but by people who, for people who were extremely busy and extremely, you know, short on time, and say, so, okay, well, could you explain Bitcoin and blockchain in about, I mean, no, no more than 10 minutes? They say, okay, well, then, then the best way of doing that is to say one sentence. This is one of the most interesting political challenges of the century. And then maybe in the nine remaining minutes, are there any questions? And, 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 the ver and I started saying this four years ago, and what just happened two hours ago when the US government uh, asked uh, yes, Facebook stop. to stop, to put on hold the Libra project that is led by a company that is not a nation state, a company led by a, an individual who has most of the voting rights. He is still the majority of the rights, if I'm correct. So actually, this is just you know, driven by one individual who is actually received at the Elysee like a, a, state, a, head, of state, a yeah. head of state. And there are pictures on the web. You, you, you'll find him. Uh, but we're still st starting and trying to launch a currency, because at the end it's a currency, that would be used by 2.3 billion people. So you would, you would, in a way, start to see something similar to a country that would be the biggest country in the world. Uh, if you go back to uh, financial authorities, system. the KYC level you have on each of your citizens, each of your money or Libra holders is unprecedented. Nobody knows as many detailed things about each of its users, each of its currency users, than Facebook. So this is a political challenge. We, we are there. Exactly as Bitcoin, when it was launched, was a political challenge, or more precisely, a political response to the financial crisis, uh, to the Lehman Brothers' demise. Uh, and that was the moment in history where distrust in people was at its maximum. Lots of people had lost money. And some, some people had lost all of their savings in, in, uh, in, uh, in structured products, in, uh, in mortgages, and, and so on. Which, by the way, brings us back to one very simple principle. Never invest in something that you don't understand. Period. You don't need a lesson. You don't need, a, you don't need a, an MBA. On, on that particular topic, this is just wisdom. And if you don't understand something, you ask why until you say, I've understood. And it turns out that this is the topic where, where the whys can, can, can last long. Uh, my last comment is that, uh, so I, I got curious about that. I realized that this was just way too complicated and that uh, nobody would understand what it was about. And so that the best way to explore this was to do that with several institutions, with several players, because at the end, this is a network. This is a security network or a payment network, but this is a network. So if you want to understand the network, you better play with a few other players on the network. And so this is what, what we did with a, an initiative called LabChain, where around the Caisse des Depots, which is uh, for Kitty a very large financial institution, public financial institution, we brought several partners together, startups, other financial institutions, just, you know, just to put our hands in the, in the sandbox and try to understand what we could do with that. And that was the very moment where the I, when the ICOs began. And the most intriguing thing in the ICOs, when I realized that it was going, no, it was going totally mad, 
is that we started to see the first ICOs that lasted a few seconds. I remember there have been what 600, 700 ICOs so far, so I, I never remember the names, but I remember very well that maybe uh, around the, the hundred first ones there was one. Again, don't remember the name. Lasted 30 seconds. They raised 35 million dollars. How can you possibly act into something that you don't even have time to, to understand it? Maybe the white paper was published a few days before, but anyway, I mean, you, you could not even enter the game. It was game over. Uh, the second very interesting uh, point about ICOs is what happened with uh, the DAO. If you want to read a little about uh, how ICOs started and, and why it, it became totally crazy, look at what happened with the DAO. DAO, Decentralized yeah, Autonomous There was a big project to run and to... to to run a fund that would fund uh, decentralized autonomous organizations. And so they guy, these guys published a white paper saying, well, this is how we are going to proceed. This is, this is the target. We want to enable decentralized autonomous organizations, so we need to fund them and to allocate funds for them to start. Uh, you know what a DAO is or not? A decentralized autonomous organization is the, tokeniza the tokenization of governance in companies. The idea being that when a decision has been made, it will be irrevocably applied because it's scripted, it's recorded, and it, it's a program that will be triggered on outside events and that will just execute. So you, you, you will never be able to say, no, 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 I didn't elect this person as the chair of the audit committee or I never committed to publish uh, my, 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 my financials every month or whatever. You know, any decision is recorded and is enforced. And so these guys issued a white paper, said, never said what, how much they wanted to raise, just said, okay, we, we, will, we will be the mother of all DAOs. And this is the process that we will use to uh, issue the tokens. Uh, the, you will use Ether to buy the tokens, and, uh, and it will last for two weeks, three weeks. And this is the curve, so everything was explained. And there was one very important word on the website, which is, not code is low, but almost, say, well, in case of a dissent, if you don't disagree, if you don't understand, well, refer to the code. The code of the DAO, because the DAO was just a big piece of software, a script that could be read and audited by everybody. But for that, you needed to be a programmer and to understand what it was about. And, and that, was the, that was the truth. So if ever there was a mistake, if ever there was a problem, refer to the truth. It's public, so there's nothing hidden. There's no catch. Everything is there. Look and decide. These guys, three guys, raised the equivalent in Ether of $160 million. And at the time, they, raised, they pumped, what, a fourth, 25% of the old stock of Ether. So they created a huge imbalance in the stock of available Ether. Okay? If you think about it, it's like a fund that was raised with no prospectus, no investment thesis, no LPs, no limits for a first or a second closing. And so no way of aligning everybody's interest because you would, I mean, you would not know what they would be invested in and, and, and for how long. And then the magic happened. There was a fault in the script. The script had been public for two years. Remember, it had been developed in open source by lots of developers. What, everything that I tell you, you can find it on the web. It's documented, okay? And one day, uh, two, day two years sorry, before it was launched, so approximately, there was a guy who said, well, don't you think that we have, there is a, a design error here? And the guy said, well, what would it be? You know, you could be able to withdraw funds without checking the balance, and so you could withdraw funds again, so you could call yourself without any external uh, you know, limit verification. And then a guy said in the comments line, say, well, you know, when would this happen? And it happened in the DAO. There was one guy who had identified the flow and who used it. Exactly if you would be going to, a, you know, to an automatic teller machine, you would just withdraw 100 euros and withdraw again 100 euros without the ATM checking for your balance in your bank account. So you would just empty the ATM with no control. This is what happened on one third of the funds? $50 million. So, and then everybody realized we had a problem. 
and 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 this is the problem typically the the kind of problem that I think we need, we need to solve. My last comment is that I mean there the, are the two. One is uh, that in Bitcoin and blockchain is still a huge misunderstanding because there is a link between the two, uh, and the link is that Bitcoin is at the same time uh, the token that circulates and that some people consider as a currency, but is at the same time uh, the cement that holds the, uh, the safety of the protocol. And the reason for that is that it is also the incentive for machines to secure the protocol. So this is something bizarre. The, the supply of Bitcoin is planned and is determined each time machines secure the next block in the blockchain. So, so again, there is, there is magic. So that's my one before the last, my uh, avant-dernier comment. Sorry. <laughs> And the last one, uh, it was described by, 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 by a professor about describing the world and, and, and tokenizing the world and, and recording the truth forever, uh, irrevocably. Uh, actually, there's a catch. Yes, blockchain allows you to record things irrevocably, and it's immutable, and you cannot change what you wrote. But you can write bullshit. You can write garbage. In fact, you can write, sorry, you can write garbage. And so, all of a sudden, the trick moves from the blockchain itself, which is a very safe network, to the interfaces between the blockchain and the real world, and the capabilities of what people call pegging, which is anchoring uh, one asset of the, big, uh, of, the, of the real world, this bottle, and its equivalent, its token in the blockchain. The token will be unique. It will never be tempered. It will never be corrupted. Except that if you do not describe the right bottle, or if you, if you play with the, 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 the barcode, or if you lie on the serial number on this bottle, you will record the wrong asset forever in the blockchain. Sorry, I was a little long, but I, yeah, I, I just would like to me. echo that comment. The, the, the things that I always teased with my colleague is that the blockchain DLT, if you use it wrongly, that means you are recording garbage forever. <laughs> yeah, you cannot delete. So if you make a mistake, it's yeah, forever. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. yeah, you are recording garbage forever. So it's garbage in and garbage sits there forever. <laughs> and to get back on what you, you say... You cannot recycle it. <laughs> what's interesting about the DAO story is that, uh, yes, somebody stole the $50 million overnight, but to uh, get bounced back on what you said, when they were asked... When, of course, somebody raised the alarm and said $50 million was stolen. And the guy who stole the $50 million, as you said, said, I used the code. Yes. <laughs> it was there. It's in the code. The code is a smart contract. You know the difference between Bitcoin and smart contracts that the first uh, blockchain uh, ledger was the Bitcoin. The Bitcoin technology doesn't allow smart contract. But then a smart guy named Vitalik Buterin came up with a new protocol called Ethereum in 2015, which allows to do smart contract. Now, it's a self-executable contract. Mm -hmm. The O is one. Mm -hmm. So when the contract has a flow, the guy says, it's not a flow. I just executed mm. the contract and you can't mm. get back to that. So yeah. you can't ask me to give yeah. back the 50 million. Yeah, which explains that you need, uh, you need uh, lawmakers and you, you need lawyers who understand code. And you need programmers who understand law. And, and you need those two guys or two girls coming together and put aside their respective egos. So the lawyer should not say, well, you know, I'm a lawyer. I describe the world as it is, so you should listen to me first. And the coder should, should not say, you know, I'm a coder, I write things that you will never understand, so you should, you should be careful because I have already hacked your smartphone while we were talking. <laughs> if you start with that, we will never go anywhere. And, and, and one of the big, big challenges is a cultural one, which is to find uh, the right uh, pairs or the right groups of people who will be able to collaborate and to bring together and, and to look at the same observable reality from their com uh, complementary angles. Because as you said, Professor Bono, the guy who lost $50 million, you can tell him when you lose, you lose. I'm not sure it really works. And then again, legally speaking. In fact, uh, if I uh, try to expand on something, mm. uh, I think uh, for me, I don't uh, address exactly in the same way Bitcoins and ICO. 
Because finally, and uh, if I understand, uh, this uh, new uh, cryptocurrency was finally uh, banned by the United States. In fact, uh, when you consider Bitcoin, it's a, a competitor, a kind of competitor of legal currencies created by the public authorities. Consequently, there is a question of sovereignty for countries. Alors, it's clear that some people said, but uh, finally, when you take into account um, credits, uh, through credits, finally, credit institutions can create currencies and money. But finally, whatever the way we create money, from this point of view, in fact, there is a real control of the public authorities. It's the monetary policy. And uh, this fact is, uh, in my opinion, uh, not controversial. By contrast, finally, and clearly uh, there is one uh, issue, because when you take into account Bitcoin or uh, Libra, in fact, from an economic <laughs> point of view, from an economic point of view, some people consider that there are real currency. But from a legal point of view, you could you can read uh, La Loi Bright, you can read the last uh, directive about uh, money uh, laundering. In fact, there is a definition clearly they underline that they are not from a legal point of view a currency. And there is an ECG decision on the in 2015, and clearly it was underlined that Bitcoin was not a currency. It was a contractual means of payment. And finally, you can say, but maybe, and I'm not against Bitcoin, I'm against Bitcoin if Bitcoin is considered as legal currency. Because there are some impacts we should uh, think of uh, in fact, and particularly, the question is who is authorized to create currencies? Maybe we can say private people. But in fact, uh, you come back to uh, the feudality. Feudality? And, uh, <laughs> feudalism, in fact, in English. And consequently, I think we should be cautious, and I think we need at least a debate, in fact. We should understand all the consequences when you consider Bitcoin as a currency. After, everyone can have an opinion, but I think uh, we mustn't neglect this debate. And it's true, one day someone said to me, but Bitcoin is used by everyone. This kind of debate is absolutely useless. I disagree. This kind of debate is not useless. But from uh, yeah. this issue, mm -hmm. we should uh, clearly uh, make a distinction with ICO, because ICO is only a means finally used in order to raise money. But finally, after, what, he, uh, what kind of product investor uh, can buy? What are uh, the rights uh, attached to coins? What is the interest for investors? And clearly, it's on this point that the public authorities try to focus uh, its attention, because finally after, uh, there are a lot of people. They buy everything, in fact. They are not aware of the fact uh, of about the, the buy because in fact they try to uh, assess the financial interest is more or less a casino and I saw that as a member of the Commission Epargne. It was something I discovered from a certain uh, uh, point of view. And I think it's the reason why I said, uh, yes, okay, I'm not a fan of uh, organizing the precise protection, but except the way we market, in fact, all these financial products, because we can be influenced 
by someone. And there are some uh, strong uh, techniques used by people through the internet, and they are particularly violent and can influence uh, clearly investors. But I think that uh, after I don't, uh, uh, I think we should be cautious and finally you should be aware at the same time that we organize a parallel system. Finally, when you consider the banking system and even the financial market is the traditional system. And finally, we try to put in place another system which is different from the traditional system, but maybe it's connected to the globalization. In fact, because finally, and it's the reason why I insist on the fact that we should try to understand the consequences for our society. It's clear that maybe countries like France should disappear because there is no interest in a globalized world. We live in a, in, in, on a planet. It's a little village. We uh, don't. There are. We are. Um, we should live without borders, and from this point of view, our countries, and maybe it's an uh, answer to this kind of uh, changes in fact in our world, is the reason why I insist again, I think we should establish connection between general consideration, and we mustn't see only the uh, um, immediate profit that you can get with this kind of uh, product, but I'm only a professor, and what's more, a <laughs> flow. Okay. Maybe if I could add, um, maybe the professor has mentioned around legal and, society, uh, and, and the economic perspective, but I just would like to add one part that um, I think the issues that we need to really address, uh, whether it's um, actually it's also with the traditional instruments like banknote, uh, for digital tokens, I think what is important, whether it's Bitcoin, ICO, or, any, or utility coins or anything, is actually around um, AML, KYC. Because um, we need to balance between efficiency that uh, these new instruments is trying to solve, accessibility and everything, but also safety of the overall world. Because the moment that you allow wrongdoing in this kind of ecosystem, it means that anyone can do illegal things in the most efficient way. It's, That's actually yeah, very, very yeah, important. It's clear the main problem from the beginning. It's a question of money laundering. Yes. I, I remember four or three years ago, I organized a little conference. Like it was the student who organized a little. And there are a lot of people working for companies. And at one moment, because I said one of the main problems is connected to the money laundering mm -hmm. legislation. And someone said, but there is no problem. But be sure, because they are representative of l'AMF and la CPR, these people, uh, as me, said, OK, we must be cautious. We must be cautious, because they use, yeah. in fact. And it's become our system, in fact. And the end of this kind of issue is that everyone can be poorer and poorer if we don't uh, uh, pay attention to this kind of uh, issue. It, it has taken us 100 years to organize and put into this, put in system financial markets. But if we allow such wrongdoing happens, it means that we are actually introducing backward innovations. Yes, the, pro the problem is, uh, yes, sir, please. No, I think you need to balance this with uh, privacy. Yes. Because privacy is also very important for freedom. And uh, we always say that Bitcoin was created because of the financial crisis, but the reality is that Bitcoin was created because of privacy, initially. Because encryption. And the cypherpunks, the, the guy who led to the creation of Bitcoin, it started from in they the destroyed. 90s. In fact, they, dis the 90s. They, they destroyed the public authorities because there was a philosophy behind Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Libertarianism. And, yes. And privacy. And, um, privacy. Yes, but privacy is very, it's, in my opinion, one of the main issues yes. for the future. Because more often than not, <laughs> privacy is back and back, in my opinion. The whole problem is 
we balance, all right. But the problem of the, and I think that's what you're referring to, we, are, we may go backwards because it took us hundreds of years to come up with AML, anti-money laundering laws, and KYC, know your customer yeah. procedure. But that's country per country. Mm -hmm. It's not the same in France, in Switzerland. Now, what about a currency that covers both France, Switzerland, and other countries such as Thailand? What about to another level, because I think we can agree it's a new issue, Libra, mm -hmm. that automatically make over, over, over two, mi two billion people. How do you implement AML and AYC in all this it's area? How do you talk to a guy with that powerful? How can Emmanuel Macron talk to Mark Zuckerberg and say, you need to implement yeah. our AML procedure? Yeah, uh, yeah and one, one, one of the interesting uh, and, and, and the funny thing in the debate, uh, first of all, I, I strongly and politely but strongly disagree when there is a a comparison between Lib Libra and Bitcoin because uh, the philosophy is different, different, the technology is different, everything is different. So I, I don't think it, it plays in the same ballpark. But if we look at that from the political angle that you mentioned, uh, at least with Libra, you know who, to, who you can talk to because you can you can ask uh, Zuckerberg to come. Uh, maybe he will not show up, but at least you can ask you can ask somebody to come. You can you can in, in, you can uh, you can have, you have attribution to a company. Uh, the interesting thing with Bitcoin is that you don't even know who you're talking to. Satoshi Nakamoto, nobody proved. Nobody knows who is. if this is one, several people. Uh, the people who pretended they were uh, never, they were not able to prove it except by tautology, so it doesn't work. Uh, I mean, that's that's the case for Craig, right? Uh, there is a, you might have seen there is an interesting trail that goes now to Estonia. Uh, there, there's been a few uh, a few publications about that, but for the moment. There is nobody a uh, chief of state can t or, or a regulator can talk to uh, because, because nobody knows. Conversely, and this is where I, I also defer, uh, the, if I agree with you that considering Bitcoin as a currency uh, that is on par with the others uh, is probably a mistake. The problem is that there are markets. In markets, you, you buy and sell things where you, you decide that the value is, is the meeting point. Same for gold. Uh, the price of a, of, of a gold ounce is, is a meeting point between, balance, uh, between supply and demand. So that's, that's the issue. But, but again, if you talk about supply uh, of the token uh, or of the payments mean, because it's, uh, the, the white paper said a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system, uh, actually the, 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 the supply is known, is controlled, cannot be changed. So no uh, no. State, no big country can decide to, uh, uh, to leverage its uh, economic competitiveness by devaluating the currency. No, this, this is not possible. It is everything, and it is public, and it is transparent, so there, again, there is no hidden catch. Everybody can know exactly how many Bitcoins are circulating right now and how many will be circulating in 10 minutes from now. So again, there are lots of differences, but the, the, again, the most interesting one for me on a political standpoint is that you don't know who you're talking to. But it connects to the fact that, again, it might have been serving uh, interest for, for a few hackers, uh, knowing that we can dive into that. There is a difference between anonymity and pseudonymity, but I don't think we have time for that now. Or at least if the question bounces, we, we'll check for that. But before that, remember that in 2008, despite all the financial regulations that were operating in the United States, uh, there were lots of structured products that nobody wouldn't understand that were deliberately sold and exported extraterritorially ter 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 uh, outside of the United States and that actually polluted the whole world. Uh, and that happened in a world where the system was supposed to have been working for the past 100 years. And so there is a way to read this which is not comfortable. It's, it's not easy to face it. I'm not saying it's great. I'm just saying it's here that says, well, in a system that just has proven that men can be faulty, let's imagine uh, another way of transferring value that is not men-related, where all the system is operated and validated by machines. And the best definition I found, I, I, Kitty has probably also used it, when, when, when people were studying this, to say, okay, well, how do machines validate exactly the transactions and, and how do they... How, okay, it's called the proof of work, but I don't understand it. Well, the proof of work is the exact opposite of the captcha. You know the captcha when you go to a website. Mm -hmm. It's okay, well, prove that you're a human. 
and you are asked to click on buses or on, on crosswalks or on cats or what, no, no longer cats because IA is capable of recognizing cats everywhere. So forget about cats. But, you know, you are proving that you are a human person. The proof of work is the exact opposite. It is a, a mechanism that ensures that no human has been interfering with any transaction. So if, if you think about it uh, just two seconds, when The Economist puts on its cover, November 2015, if I'm correct, uh, Bitcoin and blockchain became a serious issue, uh, a serious topic when The Economist put that on its front page. Before that, it was just a scam for, for hackers, and then it became serious. I guess you will agree with me. But then, the title was The Trust Machine. I'm sorry, but when I read The Trust Machine, I also read the, the absolute distrust in people. And so you need to keep that in mind. So we are facing a system that has been invented by some, some people we don't know, that has value because lots of people are using it, that is totally auditable because all the code is public. Again, there is no hidden catch. Everything is public, and that happens to run and to, and to function, and that has been functioning for the past 10 years. But we don't know who to talk to. And that, of course, from a political body standpoint, is something you cannot accept. It's easy. We will see. History will tell if it's easier to yell at Mr. Zuckerberg than to just say that Bitcoin is not serious. But that's another part of the story. But, but again, the idea that you don't know who you're talking to is something very bizarre for, for, for policymakers. Yes, because but from a political point of view, even if you know uh, who are behind a currency, I think for public authorities, the issue is similar because you create something which competes with what you created yourself. It's a question of sovereignty. Consequently, I'm not sure that uh, it's very vital to know who is behind. And what's more, if I understood well what uh, you have just said, but uh, uh, you seem to consider that there is no possibility of falsification. And I think at the beginning, you, you said, in fact, it's a uh, supposition. Because even if it's conceived, in a way, we can't falsify something. Be sure that at one moment, someone will be capable of falsifying the instrument, I think. And uh, even because at the beginning, when I started to uh, read in fact about because finally for a lawyer, it's clear uh, the technique is something quite difficult to understand. Mm. And you should understand what is it precisely if you want to have a clear uh, opinion and you uh, from a legal point of view but at the beginning in some article they said it's impossible to falsify now some people recognize that we can falsify donc clearly i think we should be cautious and after in fact behind a, a machine there are human beings and finally it depends on the way they create their software, their machine. And from a legal point of view, I know I need to know who are behind because if there is something wrong, I can't put in jail a robot. It's been proved uh, by researchers that you can hack into the Bitcoin. For example, uh, when a transaction is validated by robots, uh, as soon as somebody wins the Bitcoin lottery, he validates transactions, and then the news is spread to all the other computers in the protocol. But it's been proved that if two computers validate the transaction, and by the time that the first one has validated transaction, if it hasn't reached the other one, and the other one already validates transactions as well and already wins the lottery, it's been proved it can create a fork because Bitcoin wasn't designed to be that big and to concern that many people. This happened, this was proved, and in that case, as you say, we don't know who we have to talk to. That's why we need somebody, uh, we need attribution, we need somebody to be eventually responsible. Now, the question is, can we go back to governments? Who do we talk to? Deities? Well, governments don't code. <laughs> governments don't I'm code? I'm sorry, governments don't code. Yeah. So governments will not be able to fix the code. 
because basically, and again, I'm, I'm not saying, I, I'm just trying to, uh, to help you or, or to confuse you so that you get out of this <laughs> masterclass not, I mean, you should no longer be binary when you look at this. That, that, that's at least my personal goal. Is, is you, you, sh you should understand that, that, that it's more complicated than that. But that there are a few elements that, that, that really deserve uh, further thinking. This is code. The code is public. The only way to update it or to, to change it is to have a consensus of m as many people as possible so that a new version of the code is deployed on all the machines. Because you can, I mean, again, it's open source. So you can, you can take the code and make a few tweaks and say, hey, I have a new version of Bitcoin. I'm the king. You publish that, and three people, uh, including your girlfriend and your father who doesn't understand anything, use it. use it. So you have a network of three people capable of exchanging something that has no counterpart on the rest of the network. So again, it's, 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 and that's an interesting governance issue because it means that the flexibility of making changes is really difficult. And, and this, this is all about the hard forks, because when you do a hard fork, all of a sudden you create two branches that will coexist and that will carry the same token. So all of a sudden you have duplicated the token, nobody understands exactly what it means in terms of value. But when you look backwards, you realize that uh, the forks that have been happening didn't really change uh, the, 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 the value of, of at least the, main, the mainstream token. Yes, Bitcoin, Bitcoin so, Cash, for example. So yeah, so it's, again, it's, it's, it's the, the only thing that is important at this stage is that you know that this is code, that it is code that, yes, of, of course, we don't know who created it, but is it important? Satoshi Nakamoto's got 5% of the... Yes, but that's a different story. Because Satoshi Nakamoto got, okay, has 5%, 10%. They are, they are what people call Bitcoin whales that sit on tops of Bitcoins and that have never, never moved their tokens for the past four years. Okay, uh, so what? When it started, until 2011, 2012, uh, the dollar value of Bitcoin was zero. It was a game that people, it was like a ping pong ball. People were just playing ping pong and they were happy with that. And then all of a sudden, slowly but surely, people started to consider that this was, this was something worth holding, worth uh, buying. And so people wanted to buy Bitcoin and then they started to exchange dollars for Bitcoins. And this is how the market was created. It started with a pizza, historically. Yes, yes. historically, yeah. Somebody said, I want a pizza. I for, give... For, Two pizza, I give 10,000 Bitcoin yeah, to 10, whoever Bitcoin. gives me Just, two pizza. Yeah. 10,000, two pizza. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the guy resold it. Uh, yeah, the, 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 the pizza guy resold them immediately. But, but that's, uh, but, but yeah, so, so I mean, and, and, and this is where the professor is absolutely right. Most, of, I mean, some of the questions we are all debating about are linked to the fact that there is a, a, a dollar or a euro value uh, on these tokens, and that's the same for, for, for Ether, for, for, for Ethereum, there are token values, one of the, and, and, and so there is, so there are uh, fluctuations over time, so there are uh, rates, so you can follow that, and so you have people starting to make predictions, and then you have people starting to hedge themselves and starting to write futures or whatever, so I mean you have a market with an underlying, an, 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 sorry, an underlying asset that nobody understands about. But you have, you have the usual mechanism of market. And that is, yes, that is, a, that is a, a, a big issue because you need absolutely to educate people about what's going on and what they could lose. And you need to educate their comportment. But in a way, what they are putting their money in is not really different from any very complicated structured product that holds uh, uh, what that typically example, what, what was circulating in the 207s and the 208s. Nobody understands them anymore. People just buy and sell them to uh, holders who are not educated on that because every, everybody talks only about performance. And one of the biggest, sorry, and I will finish with that, one of the biggest mistakes uh, inducing people wrongly, in my, in my mind, is when people talk about Bitcoin market cap. Why is it, I mean, is it market cap would be for securities? So if you, if you, you could, 
talk about the whole volume of you never say the dollar market cap. Yeah. You say yeah. the amount of dollars in circulation, if you, if you know them. Or you say the amount of euros that have, that have been printed by the ECB uh, for the past 10 years. Nobody knows how, exactly how much, but you, have, you count in trillions, that's enough. Why do we talk about market cap when it comes to, 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 to bitcoins and ethers? They are not securities. They don't hold any promise of uh, dividends. I agree with you. And that is something that fools people because... Uh, they say market cap, okay, market, so I can speculate. And therefore, I'm, I'm naive, so anybody, and I, I absolutely agree with you, anybody that comes and sells me a scam about, you should purchase this, look, it, it, it went up to the sky and it will go up again, and so you should, that, that's, that's where the problem is to me. Uh, in, in, in fooling people about lots of things. In, in fact, a few years ago, about CFD, Contract for Differences, ESME, the European Securities and Market Authority, uh, published uh, a notice, in fact, uh, and because uh, CFD are kind of the relative instrument, like very difficult, uh, and if I refer it, it's because of the example. It's clear that some people buy some... Uh, uh, difficult, uh, complicated uh, products in fact. But in this notice, as I said, if you don't understand, you don't buy. But in fact, in practice, they buy even if they don't understand. It's the main issue, it's the in, my, in my opinion. It's After, the it's the we hack. can't protect people against themselves. They must be aware. If, like, uh, some of you maybe smoke some cigarettes, you know that uh, if you smoke too much, and maybe even one cigarette, you can die. And finally, when you buy some financial product, if you don't understand, and finally, when I consider, when I see uh, the complexity of financial products, but I think... Maybe uh, hardly one percent of people know really what they buy. It's very mm. complex, in fact. It's one of the main issues. It's the reason why I'm not a fan of complex products for ordinary people like me, uh, notably, because I think we don't have the uh, technical and the financial knowledge and even if you know one financial product one kind of derivative for example it doesn't mean that you understand the other categories of derivative instrument because they can be really complex is the reason why even when you consider tokens and coins maybe you can understand one specific category of coin but not all you should be Cautious, in fact, is the main difficulty, in my opinion, uh, for this kind of process. So we'll take questions from uh, this Napoleon, gentleman. After, after uh, okay, so please. I have two, two questions. The, the first one is considering uh, money laundering. Don't you think that uh, crypto assets, cryptocurrencies, are an opportunity? Uh, because you can track uh, all the story of, uh, of your assets. I don't speak about uh, money or the cash. And considering Libra, don't you think that it could or it should have been a project led by the World Bank, for instance? Because in its uh, objective, it's also uh, 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 a way to, to bring uh, a store of value to unbanked people and a way to, for them to protect their assets. Two good questions. Maybe I'll just... Actually, this question, these two questions are actually interrelated. Um, I think you part of good... Uh, 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 point a very good point in that I think the only issue around cryptocurrency and Libra is all about customer onboarding. You need to know who is actually in that ecosystem. That's the only issue that I can see at this time. That's the girlfriend and the father. Yeah. If you if you know <laughs> that who is who in the zoo, that means everything can be managed and in order. Um, I think um, Libra is an, a good innovation. Um, it's a perfect innovation thing ahead, and it's actually a catalyst that triggers everyone around the world to think about that it's actually an issue of financial service access. Mm -hmm. The only issue that I can see, as I mentioned, is only to recognize who is who in that environment. If we could have a technology, for example, biometrics authentication, to really identify and authenticate that this is Kitty who is using this cell phone 
and we have some collaboration with an authority to ensure that this is actually that person in this system who will not <coughs> do illegal things. I think that's actually a very good point where the authority and the private sector would come together and do something good for the world. Yes, if you if you need KYC, if you request KYC, as you said, for security reasons, and you need to know who is there. It means that that, that you will never uh, achieve financial inclusion because that's what ask, I said. That was I said. We uh, we need to have a technology to allow those unbanked to access and authenticate that I am myself. Yeah. I am Kitty to be into this yeah. ecosystem. Yeah, but if. It, most of the case, you are, you are unbanked yeah. because you don't have ID, because you don't have place of living, because you don't own, you don't you don't uh, earn money, so you don't you, you cannot even show your identity. Um, and Bitcoin doesn't ask who you are, doesn't ask what is your age, where you live. It, it opens you an account because there is no KYC with with uh, so. Yes, Maybe it's, 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 it's the one of the main issues in fact. It's not possible to uh, uh, eliminate this KIC because finally, if you authorize people to put their money in such uh, uh, cryptocurrency, but you uh, uh, allow uh, the money laundering, and it's something which is not the world possible. is not safe. Yeah. I think the issue that I mentioned is that. I think at least in, at least in Thailand, 90% of the people have access to cell phone, to smartphone. And if we could have a technology that allow them to authenticate themselves through smartphone, a cell phone, I think everything would be perfect. We don't really actually need distributed ledger technology and those kind of things. We just need technology to allow us to authenticate them and onboard them into, into the ecosystem. Right now, it's black and white, whether you have bank account or you have ID, but if you have something that allow me to tell that I am me, I, I'm willing to enter into this ecosystem. And we don't, do not need like full KYC as the financial services today because it's just way too much. But if we just allow someone to say that it's me, then it's okay. I'm not sure if you. I'm not sure if you. Yes, but my, my point. My point was also uh, towards the fact that uh, this uh, Libra will be managed by private interests, and it will bring. Uh, it could bring a lot of uh, public value. Yes. And I, I think or I imagine it would have been better if if if, if, if it would have been managed by public interest. For instance, the nodes. Uh, managed by uh, central banks of, yeah. uh, of countries, if I may. And, and the whole project be a public project instead of a private one. Yeah, I, I was just um, not addressing that point directly, but I just would like to explain what I am at the SET trying to do for the good of a public using distributed ledger technology and we will not be impacting monetary policy. Um, we are thinking about tokenization of waste lies in garbage. So if we could, for example, take medicines which are about to expire, not yet expired, and hospitals, pharmacies, um, everyone in the country tokenize the, that medicine, offer that to the public, and then we use distributed ledger technology to help, to, everyone is helping each other to validate the people to validate the transaction, to validate that he is actually entitled to that medicines at cheaper price. And we use smart contracts to help um, enforce the rule that he cannot resell the medicines. The medicine is still good by certification authority. So we are, I think we are approaching in a less controversial environment. And this is something that people around, at least in Thailand, uh, can participate in this network, doing something good for the society. And it's not impacting uh, the monetary policy, it's impacting the, pe the way people live and how we could reallocate resources in a most efficient way. Uh, we are not disintermediating anyone, hospital, foundations, everyone can actually be in this network they can set up a note 
and we help each other to validate. You get value and, with it. Yeah, was and no we value. don't have to go to full KYC. You can just go and register yourself as in Facebook mm -hmm. today. We can use this uh, uh, network for donation purpose. He may give citizen ID. Maybe later on he will get tax benefit by providing this uh, citizen ID. And then we enforce that. When once you donate, it will have to go through those who have registered in the network. But you are not. You cannot take the money back mm. because that's money laundering. So I think DLT blockchain. If we put in good use, uh, I would like to turn the focus of this conversation into where blockchain and DLT digital tokens can be of value to the to the whole world. Uh, I think um, I would like to turn that more because uh, there has been a lot of negative about the, these innovations. But I think any innovations, any invention, there are risks associated with that. There are opportunities. But if we put this thing in good use, I think um, this invention can actually impact all many, many million, billion people around the world. At least this is actually the, um, our mission at the exchange that we would like to make the capital market work for everyone. And that is 77 million people in Thailand. And we believe that this is one of the things that we could do to put good use, technology in good use, to impact the people across the country. And if uh, the people outside Thailand would like to join this network, it's easy. It's as more secure version of internet. So we can make impact. Uh, the ones in, um, in, in the US can impact life in Africa. The ones in here in Paris can impact a small province in in Thailand. I think we should uh, um, that, that we, we can dedicate some conversation around issues and risk. But uh, I think we should think positively mm -hmm. and put see good the good things. instead of the yeah. Program. There are good and bad things. Like it's like money. It's good when you have it, but it's not good when you don't have it. So, so it depends on the perspective that you would like to leverage on this invention. Adam, yes, uh, if I can. Uh, at first, we were talking about uh, currency, as uh, say professor, cryptocurrency. So, um, in a legal point of view, uh, Bitcoin is not a currency. But um, if we uh, take uh, an example, in uh, if life is a, a zoo or a jungle, we are afraid about lions or gorilla. I don't know, uh, maybe in life, thief uh, or criminal. But uh, as you say, um, uh, we can uh, talk about uh, the extraterritoriality of USA or other country. So I think it's a, a burning issue, but uh, we are talking about the way of life uh, and we should permit uh, uh, cryptocurrency to be used uh, as a currency. And uh, in, uh, in our case, I think it's... Uh, already the case, because uh, stablecoin uh, are fiat currency. It's uh, the same thing, but it's fiat on, uh, on blockchain. So if we put KYC in uh, every uh, issuer uh, or every company, uh, I think all the problems are solved. Yes. I think uh, it's all the issue is around. But it's very... And that's authentication of Yes, people. but I, I think it's, uh, mm. it's um, a question about the way of life. I know that uh, legal people... Uh, a lawyer are always talking about uh, uh, a sovereign a protect a protection uh, given to uh, to uh, to a state but uh, a lot of people uh, give sense to bitcoin because of this uh, this lack of power of state so uh, it's very interesting to uh, listen to you because finally one of the main problems in my opinion is to know if uh, uh, still some people are in charge of the common good, in fact. And uh, what we call in French, uh, the general interest, common good, interest general. And finally, uh, when it comes to private companies, I'm not sure that they are in charge of the common good. Alors, it's true if you take into account the La Loi Pacte, in fact, mm. la raison d'être, I don't know, la raison d'être, and so on. Bon, clearly, bon, I'm a little skeptical about this kind of uh, innovation. Or someone explained to me, but uh, we create a new world, in fact. But uh, the world is based on some uh, things, 
And I think uh, when you are in charge of the private interest, you are in charge of the private interest. I don't believe that people uh, will uh, see the common good before their private interest. And finally, after, clearly we can consider that maybe some uh, cryptocurrency can be considered as a real currency. From an economic point of view, mm -hmm. everyone says that. The issue is not, uh, it's not specifically, I think uh, my, uh, my only talk is uh, to uh, uh, push you into being aware of this kind of issues because finally it's the um, type of society you want to build in the uh, future. And there is an alternative, either we go on with some public authority or we uh, go on but with some private authorities and for me it's more or less a kind of feudalism in fact and uh, I try to study what was uh, feudality in fact and you uh, can understand after maybe we can live exactly in a private uh, area and with only private authorities but one of the main points is how can we uh, take into account the common good with such a project which, who, uh, in which are only involved private people and uh, I remain on this position when it's come to private interest I think that they don't uh, 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 they consider mainly their interests before considering uh, the common good is the reason why I'm not convinced by the reason that the so, so it's, it's a question about the consensus but uh, when we talk about legal currency a lot of people say that we have private interest behind the Fed or the the um, uh, La Banque Européenne, Banque BCE. So uh, I think uh, if uh, we talk about gold, I agree with I I don't agree with you because uh, I know that uh, one coin, one gold coin, one Napoleon uh, always dressed uh, someone, uh, f uh, always dressed someone uh, from the the truth to to uh, to the t-shirt. So and uh, we haven't anyone behind it. It's not the same thing in um, with the code we, where someone is uh, coding, but if we compare uh, cryptocurrency and uh, currency, legal currency, if, we, if, uh, if, I, if I take it, I think that uh, we could use this cryptocurrency in order to uh, concur concurrence, compete, with compete uh, to challenge uh, the this uh, sovereign currency. Uh, I would like to make one comment and then to go back to what, uh, what Kitty was trying to, to take us. Uh, I fully agree that uh, the common good, the public interest, uh, is, is at stake. I would just make uh, two observations. The first one is, where is, and this is the very uh, politically incorrect moment, uh, where is the common good or the public interest when not everybody votes and when actually there is such a level of abstention that people do not realize that they this is one of the ways democracy allows them to express what they want where is the public uh, interest or the common good when on the radios and on the media you hear ministers telling you that you should drink when it's hot is it their job to spend time telling you on the radio that you should drink don't, don't, don't you think we should be treated as adults? Don't you, think, don't you think we would deserve a little more explanations on the law or on what is at stake? But what's funny is that every, anytime, every time when something important is at stake, you are asked to consent to what you don't understand and because it's better for everybody and because the government is in charge. Mm. And that is not called feudalism, it's called communism. Mm. And I'm not sure such regimes have proven that they work or that we would like us to live in, into them. And, and that's, and that's my, my point is valid when it comes to privacy and to, and because you will realize that privacy restrictions always happen when dramatic events occur and when in emergency we, have, we pass laws and bills that will make it absolutely, I mean, the, the last one about, uh, about uh, hate speech, 
will be a nightmare because who will decide exactly where is head and where is not? Mm -hmm. So we are just embarking into a, a journey where, again, you will be asked more and more to consent to things that you don't understand. And for that, uh, there is a talk from Dem the Dambisa Moyo. Uh, you should check that on the USI website. Uh, the conference was happened a few days ago. And Dambisa, Dambisa Moyo is an economist uh, uh, that is very renowned. And she has all a chapter in her talk and in her last book about what shall we do to fix democracy. So I will close that. And now I would like to go back to impact. Because uh, what Kitty said is absolutely critical. The, 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 the magic with uh, distributed ledger technology is that it looks at transactions no longer from the transacting party's point of view, but from the token point of view. And the only question it answers is actually, who does this belong to now? And who did it belong to before? before. Basically, how does the, tr the responsibility transfer happen? And, this, and to me, this is where you, where you can have impact, because you, then you can track. And you can track assets that circulate. You can track, you can track rights to consume med mm -hmm. medicine or not. Because at any time, you ask where, uh, where was that, that pill, and, and who did, where, it was, where, where was it before, and where should it go or not? And that's, that's, that's absolutely critical. And, 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 just to, um, and that is also, from a governance standpoint, uh, uh, something that could work at a smaller scale. Uh, and the scale, at the scale of cities, I'm, uh, I'm advising a project uh, on, on smart cities that allows them to calculate the impact of their citizens' behaviors. Yeah, actually, that was I was going to tell that yeah. the reason that we embark on this journey is because we see this as a bridge to sustainability ESG, ESG social impact. It can be calculated in a standardized way. And back to your point around traceability, it's very important to do KYC because otherwise you are tracking something. You know where it goes, but you don't know who is actually the start. Without that the starting point, then it's it meaningless that you can track and trace. It happened to Martin Schreckley. Mm -hmm. uh, this guy was doing Bitcoin trading, and uh, it was proved that he got some Bitcoin that were coming from... Uh, from a uh, money laundering after a drug, tra a drug trade on the Silk Road. And it was proved by the FBI that not only he knew about these Bitcoins and he, he helped launder them, but he knew about the origin of the Bitcoins because he put it in a, in, a, in a mail. That's why he ended up in jail or with a, mm, yeah. with a electronic ring. So that takes us back to KYC. But then it's the US FBI uh, that arrested a US citizen how do you do a, a KYC on somebody from another country? Thailand, 75 million, 90% have a chip on their phone. I agree. What about China? How do you do K KYC on China? If Bitcoin exploded in 2013, yeah. it's because it opened on the Chinese market. Yes. Yeah, I, I would like to go back to impact. Not, not, to, not to advertise on the product. I will not give the name so that mm -hmm. you won't be you won't say that I, I advertise on anything. <laughs> but what's important is at the city level, cities now are more and more trying to incentivize their citizens to take their bike to go to work or to, to, to change to shift their behaviors. The problem they have is twofold. One, they need to they, they need to measure the impact of such behavioral changes. And second, in some cases they would like to monetize this impact by aggregating it and either selling it on the market, that would be for uh, carbon uh, rights, yes, mm -hmm. carbon or to be able to sell it to the nation, and that, that is subsidies. The problem is that in both cases, you absolutely need to prove to your counterpart that what, we, what you are trying to sell them, which are rights, have not been sold already. And this is where using blockchain and DLT is extremely interesting because not only it allows you to massify and to calculate your impact by looking at the, 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 the electric bike kilometers without caring about the fact that you were on the bike or that it was bike number 200062A. Uh, you, you don't care. What's important is that you are sure that these kilometers are unique and that they have been counted once. So that is, that is one. So you can, you can actually preserve privacy by still securing uh, the unicity of the impact assets. 
And then, again, when you aggregate everything and you put that on the, on the carbon market, uh, a, carbon, uh, a polluter who wants to buy your carbon credits want, wants to make sure that he's not buying twice the same thing, because then it's a fraud. Uh, and that's the same for other type of, uh, of uh, impact uh, measures. And again, this is, this is a very interesting, and, and, and that's ultimately the same in my mind for subsidies, because th there will come a time when um, Western uh, countries will be so out of money that subsidies will become something very difficult, and then you will be able to prove that you deserve your subsidies, and then we will invent subsidy as a service. And subsidy as a service is something that you will be entitled to as a city or as, as, as a, a public entity, as long, as long or as soon as you can prove that you've done something. And if you bring the evidence, and the evidence cannot be challenged, uh, because everybody is sure that it is unique, then you might get your subsidies based on the impact you brought to the community. So that's, that's a project I believe a lot in. Yes, we're going to take questions from now on, okay. because if it's all right with you, we're going to be in the last part. Uh, of this uh, very interesting debate. Well, I think it's very interesting. So Actually, please. there was a question. There was a comment. I wanted to bring a, another perspective of uh, uh, about blockchain because you seem uh, very uh, skeptical. I'd like to say that uh, actually, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually... It's the legal conscience of the table and we have the business conscience of the table. That's why I put them on each side. Uh, okay. We have to take uh, uh, point. Uh, actually, <laughs> I, I, I would like to say that... Uh, uh, um, well, you, you should look at, at things uh, another way. It's like uh, about looking at uh, good, uh, good projects, etc. It's a, the idea basically in any uh, system, there are processes, you map your processes, and there are pain points in these processes. And don't talk about blockchain. There are technologies, yeah, and from time to time, uh, for these pain points, there are solutions that some technologies address. And it, uh, as a matter of fact, Blockchain addresses some pain points, like pain points with traceability, like uh, uh, shortcuts uh, in processes. Uh, okay, uh, a, a number of um, a number of pain points, and that's just uh, uh, what is addressed. For example, with um, money, we talked about cryptocurrency, but you don't necessarily have to look at a cryptocurrency as Another money, I would say, yeah. there are a lot of uh, discussions uh, going on about stable coins, etc. Stable fact, coins are based um, on a, indexed on a fiat money, so exactly. it mixes the two. So you can use uh, this technology, actually, which actually is blockchain, but you don't care. Mm -hmm. This technology is to simplify these uh, financial transactions. Uh, it's the same with uh, security tokens. Um, it, it's um, security tokens. Uh, um, security token offerings are basically the same things that I investors have been doing for many, many years. It's just that we've simplified the game. It's not. It's, it answers to the same rules. We're trying to adapt the rules to make this even simpler. But we're just simplifying this game. And uh, to to go in, in your direction, exactly. It's like any project. The idea is. You have a world, and the idea is to, to try to make it better and have advantages with that. For example, with the, uh, the project that was presented at the very beginning with the uh, Chobo Serial, it's about um, streamlining and um, uh, improving the ecosystem the with fa within farmers and suppliers, etc. Uh, and actually, the idea is at the end that it, it really helps the, uh, the farmers. Uh, it really, really helps with uh, ensuring that the farmers are incentivized towards uh, using uh, less uh, polluting products, etc. And uh, it, it's about this. And uh, as a matter of fact, to, to reach these goals, some blockchain technologies and also other technologies are of use. And that's all. We're not talking about um, opposing the current world with another one. We are talking about Making a using... Yeah, improving it with new technologies. So you are what we call a blockchain evangelist. Yes, but mm. I think the new technology, we should be cautious, in fact, because when I'm, uh, listen, uh, I'm listening to you, in fact, uh, okay, you give a positive approach of uh, new technology, but when you consider, for example, it's not me who said that, but uh, the high-frequency trading, this high-frequency trading is used, in fact, on financial markets. But finally, it's clearly explained that it depends, in fact, it's not forbidden as such. But finally, some uh, 
uh, strategy can be considered as market abuses at the end of the day, but not all of them. And what I'm saying, it's only that, okay, new technology can improve our society. It's clear when you compare uh, today and uh, 50 years ago. At the same time, I think that we should be cautious because the machine uh, is not uh, the only one that must be considered. And you should consider the uh, social consequences. You should consider a lot of things in fact. And uh, finally, uh, I think that uh, my uh, what I'm saying only is okay. We should think over this kind. But I'm not specifically against. But after, I think uh, because finally, when you can, when you take into account particularly the legislation about ICO and particularly the objective of the government. The government wanted to have a legal framework. I'm not so sure that all the people in our ministry understood this kind of new technology. But nevertheless, they think that they can make profit. And only this objective. But I'm not a businessman. I'm not. I'm not a businessman. Clearly, I'm someone who try to understand the changes in our society. After, I can give legal advice. I think, clearly, I think it's just uh, the point that I'm going. And I think it's the same. That uh, we are. This technology has pros. Can be used in a good way and in a bad yes, way. Absolutely. And and I think the uh, what makes this technology attractive to me is at least uh, it promotes, I would say, more collaborative ecosystem where everyone can participate. And in fact, the only three themes in my mind when we approach this technology in terms of application is first, we talk about sharing economy. Second, circular economy. And third, value creation. I think that's the only three things that we talk about when approaching this technology. Not, 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 not specific to some instrument like Bitcoin or Ethereum, but we are, yeah, we are talking about DLT. This technology could enable uh, a better world and could empower everyone around the world with collective effort, collaborative effort. And we can help and we can help each other utilize this technology in a good way and to govern this network in a proper way. And I think the, the, we have legal framework, we have government, they can govern something, but there are still many things going on. But if we could work together in the whole world, use, make use of this technology to self-govern, I think that would be a better world. So, yes, please. Uh, at the Thailand Stock Exchange, will you launch uh, something uh, with the blockchain? Yes. You already have? We, we next, uh, actually, we, we will launch the Digital Asset Exchange probably next year. But at this time, we have implemented a startup market, a, a private market for SME uh, and uh, smart startups. And we are recording that on blockchain. But Actually, this project can be implemented using traditional database, but we are actually uh, just try to experiment, get ourselves hands on. But but to grow, um, there must uh, we got many questions whether we should adopt DLT or we just use technology. Actually, in our business case today, existing technology could solve the problem. But if we think about scaling into the future, it's like we are buying an options to grow into the future. So we are going to launch that uh, probably next year, but probably not in a big way, but we start from less controversial space where we could see that there must be a massive transformative purpose for this ecosystem to exist. And we, I mentioned that we are working on this prototype, this minimum viable product to tokenize medicines, offer that um, to, 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 to those in need and we start small within the organization. And essentially, I think all these things, digital tokens, DLT, should actually be invisible from everyone. 
you don't you you can use Facebook without understanding iOS or all the mechanics, and it's the same thing. We would like to make the experience of this as easy as possible because if you the moment that you put the word digital tokens to the public, seventy six million people in Thailand would not touch it. Mm. But if you say that if you download this application, you get the medicine at cheaper price. If you are eligible, then people will come. Mm -hmm. And uh, you seem to worry a lot during the discussions about um, uh, certifi certifying the uh, identity of a person. Are you addressing this issue now? Uh, actually, we are thinking about KYC at different levels. Uh, it's like uh, you, when you go to Facebook, you, uh, you, you provide your identity uh, that you believe me that I am this guy. Then if we do some other transaction, if you donate the money, maybe that's one thing. But if you would like to get something, then you may need to provide certain more information. If you like to uh, uh, hold, for example, payment tokens, maybe exceeding 10,000 euro, then you have to do something. But if you, for example, just those in need, we may manage in a way that in your wallet, you could hold up to like maybe 100 euro or 200 euro per month. That does not cause systemic risk or impose any risk or uh, any un unmanageable risk. But if you would like to make investment in financial instruments, then you have to go to full KYC. So we are thinking about different level of authentication because today's world, it's black and white. Mm. So we would like to actually expand our ecosystem to touch us, to touch everyone's life as wide as possible in a controlled, manageable environment. And we're trying somehow try to reduce barrier <coughs> to entry to them. So this is the way that we are thinking. Yeah. Okay, so but I'm not sure whether the regulator will be happy with that. But this is the way that we approach. <laughs> well, as you can, can tell, we, we have several points of view: the geographical point of view, the thematic point of view, the legal point of view, the business point of view, the financial point of view, and we also have the very enthusiastic point of view. That is, we can use the blockchain for good, and some of the people saying yes. But we also have an issue of how to control technology that is transnational. I think we all agree on the need to understand first this technology and then to make yourself your own opinion. From this point of view, it's been two hours. If it's all right with you, we're going to call it a day. And I hope you can enjoy the yeah, cocktail. And call it a week. <laughs> and call it a week. And call it a year for some. And oh, eventually <laughs> complete this conversation outside in front of the drink. Thank you so much. Merci beaucoup.